Good afternoon. I'd like to welcome everyone to EFI Foundation's report release on the role of U.S. natural gas in a low carbon world. We have a very full agenda today, so I'm going to be brief. And at this juncture, I'd like to turn it over to EFI's president and CEO, the 13th Secretary of Energy, Ernest Moniz. Secretary Moniz. You're one of the few people who was actually serious about being brief. <laughs> Uh, well, thanks, Rick, and uh, thanks to all of you for uh, coming here today, and I'll uh, certainly come back and thank our uh, special host uh, for, this, uh, for, for this event. Um, the, uh, we want to thank, first of all, uh, I should say our sponsors uh, for the work being uh, discussed today, uh, Chesapeake Energy, the Cynthia and George Mitchell uh, Foundation, GTI, IEEJ, the Japanese Energy Environmental uh, Institute, uh, Natural Allies for a Clean Energy Future, Venture Global, and Tellurian. So it's quite a, uh, quite a roster there of, of, of supporters. Uh, clearly, as we all know, uh, major events like uh, COVID-19 and, of course, uh, the ongoing uh, war in Ukraine following Russia's uh, invasion uh, have really uh, disrupted global energy markets. Uh, natural gas is <laughs> uh, very central to that uh, to that conversation. Uh, the uh, many countries in Europe, of course, have struggled to deal with the shocks. But uh, not said enough is also how the ripples of uh, price volatility, for example, have really come to to hit emerging economies and and developing countries, uh, uh, et cetera. Uh, and so, clearly. Uh, uh, the whole clean energy transition and climate change uh, uh, remains uh, very, very central uh, in the discussions about the directions uh, in the energy system, uh, but so was energy security now. Uh, it was always there, frankly, uh, and clean energy itself is one of the long-term responses to, to energy security. But energy security has really obviously been thrust into the conversation in a much more a direct way uh, uh, in the uh, uh, in the in the wake of the uh, Russian invasion of Ukraine and the implications for the gas markets uh, in uh, uh, in particular. Now, um, we certainly at EFI have consistently stated, and frankly, long before EFI existed, have consistently stated uh, that uh, uh, natural gas is going to be a very very important uh, part of the global deep decarbonization uh, uh, move. It's certainly, the data <laughs> tells you that in the United States, uh, for example. But I think what's also important is the, uh, I'm, I'm not gonna argue there were a lot of silver linings uh, over the Ukraine uh, situation, uh, but one of them per perhaps uh, is this issue of energy security being front and, and center uh, but also the focus on the transition and not just the end state uh, in this discussion about, uh, about decarbonization. Uh, and, uh, and fossil fuels in general, but gas in particular, has got to be front and center if we are to have any success in negotiating that, uh, that, uh, that transition. Um, Lord Brown, Lord John Brown, this, the former CEO of BP, had a phrase that I love to repeat uh, in this context. Uh, uh, the quote is, pragmatism at speed is better than perfection that comes too late. And I think that pragmatism is beginning to sink in, uh, as we've seen in some recent uh, uh, discussions, um, including coming out of, the, out of the administration. So EFI, uh, launched a, a, a one-year research study uh, on the global future of natural gas in a low-carbon world. Uh, this study uh, built on prior work uh, that AFI completed um, uh, in June of 2021, um, uh, informed uh, in that exercise by engagements uh, in eight different regions around the world with the discussions carried out in partnership with, uh, with uh, regional organizations in, in each of those each of those areas. Um, the, clearly, the the Ukraine crisis and its uh, impacts on, on natural gas demand 
uh, kind of shaped the continuation of this uh, study uh, over the last uh, over the last year, uh, and we're hoping to conclude uh, this study. And you'll hear more about uh, some of the steps in reaching uh, the conclusion uh, by the year by by the year end of this year. Uh, that's when we hope to have all of this work done, uh, and certainly having the majority of the work done in time uh, to uh, to intersect with COP28, uh, uh, which will be in Dubai, as you all know, um, uh, late November, early December. And, um, and we hold out a lot of hope, frankly, that COP28 is going to be a more consequential uh, meeting of the parties uh, than, I won't name names, some of the recent meetings, shall we say. And, and part of it is precisely because the leadership of COP28 is very committed to a pragmatic approach uh, to get to get some real real results. So on January 19th of this year, uh, we convened a workshop, uh, the role of U.S. natural gas exports in a low carbon world, uh, to discuss the opportunities and challenges related to energy security uh, and decarbonization goals uh, together. We looked at policy, finance, environmental impact, and global markets. Uh, many senior executives uh, there. Uh, at that workshop, including from industry, from government, from, from NGOs, from uh, other organizations. Um, uh, and uh, again, the part of this bigger, bigger, uh, bigger, bigger effort um, that uh, we've been carrying out, now in our current work, focusing down more specifically to the uh, Europe, US, Asia uh, implications which are clearly not all, but are very central uh, to the path forward. Uh, as you see, well, those of you in the room at least have in front of you uh, a sheet with nine, uh, nine takeaways. This will be discussed uh, more. Uh, Melanie will, will, uh, uh, will go there. But you know, they, they include things like having one conversation around energy security and climate, as we've already said. Uh, uh, it includes the continuing need to address uh, methane. Uh, frankly, a major part of the social license to operate, and and all of us should just get on with it um, uh, in terms of, uh, of address, addressing methane through technology and uh, and regulation. We have significant permitting issues. Uh, I might just note that there's been some news around the Mountain Valley uh, pipeline and permitting questions. Uh, I'm not going. I'm not going into it. I'm just noting it uh, uh, that these are clearly issue. Issues, price volatility. Certainly, in the United States, we've had gas in the last uh, you know year or so. I mean, from nine dollars to less than two dollars uh, a million BTU, uh, and internationally, uh, we've already alluded to to the major uh, price excursions there. Um, we've had other discussions about uh, timing of extensions for LNG exports. Just again recently. Uh, it is amazing how much one is seeing in the developing market here for uh, for addressing uh, internationally energy security and carbon. Uh, uh, it's almost day after day one is seeing some significant uh, significant discussion. Uh, again, for the rest of the study, uh, uh, EFI uh, uh, will be again focusing on the export questions, particularly with regard to Europe and Asia, um, and we will be having workshops. Uh, in those uh, in the in those regions, uh, and uh, the findings of this uh, should be in a report, as I said, released close to the end of of this year. So that's just kind of a, a tour of the horizon uh, of what we are up to. But let me now introduce the next uh, two speakers, um, um, uh, members of Congress. And before I do that, I would be remiss in not noting a former member of Congress who was here, uh, Mary Landrieu, a senator from Louisiana, uh, and uh, a, uh, a dear friend and, uh, and, uh, and collaborator. Uh, but first, we're going to hear, uh, uh, unfortunately, virtually, uh, from Senator Lisa Murkowski. Uh, uh, she has been, of course, central to the energy discussion uh, for a long time. Uh, uh, seeking a, a bipartisan movement uh, uh, when when I was secretary and Melanie was um, uh, heading the energy policy and systems analysis effort, and Joe Heiser was CFO, and there may be others here in the room. Uh, the uh, 
uh, we worked a lot with Lisa and her Democratic colleagues, of course, in getting in what was viewed as a politically difficult time, things done. Uh, and, uh, and that was really important. Uh, Lisa wanted to be here today, but she is currently in transit. Uh, she is not at the same um, altitude that we are at the moment. Uh, and, um, and so she, she recorded some remarks. Um, and I would just note that um, I've, I was twice confirmed by the Senate for DOE positions. Uh, the first time my committee was chaired by Frank Murkowski and the second time by Lisa Murkowski. I have kind of a, I'm part of the family apparently. Uh, so uh, that we'll hear from Lisa uh, again on film. And then we're going to hear from uh, our new best friend, uh, Congressman uh, Troy Carter uh, from Louisiana's uh, second district. Um, uh, we first of all thank him for again hosting us uh, here in the, uh, in, in the Rayburn building, but thank him even more for his work uh, Transportation and Infra Infrastructure Committee, uh, and we all know uh, about how these topics are quite relevant to the discussions of energy security and, uh, and decarbonization. And of course, Louisiana, uh, we've heard this for ages from all of our Louisiana friends, they know infrastructure. They like infrastructure done the right way uh, to, uh, to advance things. And, and I would just say that uh, uh, the congressman, uh, also a, a, a leader um, in the Black Caucus here in, in, uh, in the Congress, and very committed as well um, uh, for reasons that are quite apparent in his own district, uh, the issues of social equity uh, as one builds our industrial base and our energy base. So uh, with that, let me um, turn it over to whoever's rolling the film on Lisa Murkowski, and then Congressman uh, Carter will ask you to come up and... Uh, Hello, everyone. Lisa Murkowski here, and thank you for attending this briefing. And I want to thank my friend, Secretary Moniz, for the opportunity to share my message as the Energy Futures Initiative unveils its new report on U.S. LNG exports. I am really glad to see a holistic, fact-based report that speaks to everyone, because that's exactly what we need as we try to move past our current divisions and form a lasting consensus on this critical issue. In my view, LNG exports are good for our country, good for our partners and allies, and good for the global environment, essential to our economy, our security, our international power, and our ability to fight climate change. The past few years have demonstrated how that's exactly true. As many nations scramble for affordable energy, the United States has been able to help meet their needs through record shipments of LNG. It's really quite a turn from where we once expected to be. When I first came to the Senate, the U.S. was projected to be deeply dependent on foreign gas with import terminals ringing our coasts. Instead, we're the world's largest LNG exporter now. We're now Europe's number one supplier. Our gas exports reached 10.6 billion cubic feet per day last year and are projected to grow another 20% by 2024. Now, there are uncertainties and challenges to be sure, but right now, the world is demanding more LNG, not less. Under almost every realistic scenario, significant demand will be present for decades yet to come. So we need to plan for that even as we continue to scale up renewables, advanced nuclear, and other clean technologies. And if we do, we will benefit our economy, our treasuries, and our geopolitical standing. We will reduce the world's dependence on Russia and others who wield energy as a weapon to coerce and extort. We will also protect against the second order effects that Russia's war on Ukraine has had. As Europe paid more for its energy, Many developing nations lost access to LNG, with energy security for the West threatening energy poverty for the rest. We've been a bit lucky over the past year. A mild winter and pandemic-related closures in Asia allowed many cargoes to be rerouted to Europe. But we can't count on that being the case every year, especially if it comes at the expense of developing nations and those who still lack access to reliable energy. So instead of counting on luck, we need to build consensus. We need to replace the current division around energy exports with a pragmatic path forward. And really, the sooner we do that, the better. 
You hear it all the time, but the decisions we make now will reverberate for a long time to come. They will determine whether our approach to carbon management is relatively orderly or plagued by chaos and setbacks, whether we lead the way or fall behind, and whether we benefit from it or suffer through it. While emissions are ultimately a zero-sum game, this new report recognizes that our LNG exports are not. The world is counting on us. And our response should be to produce what is needed for as long as it is needed in as clean and as safe and efficient a manner as possible. As part of that, we'll need to tap into the vast natural gas resources in my home state of Alaska, which is best positioned to help meet the needs of Asian nations. We will need to reform the federal permitting process to avoid underinvestment, ensure confidence in our projects, and respond to competition from other nations. We'll also need to consider whether and how to build out emergency assets, similar to the Strategic Petroleum Reserve, to protect against disruptions and shortages. To get this right, we need to understand recent trends and developments, what is expected going forward to the greatest extent possible, and the ideas and concerns of all involved on all sides of the debate. And that's why this new report matters. From my read, it's pretty clear-eyed and fact-based. It's written in an unbiased, nonpartisan manner. It looks at our exports through a global lens and encompasses the views of a wide range of stakeholders. And I think that's a pretty good recipe to find common ground. And the honest, informed conversation it can facilitate will only help us to form consensus on policy and deliver the best possible outcomes for our nation. Thank you very much. I could probably just sit down now <laughs> after the secretary and our illustrious senator spoke, and I think much that needs to be said has been said. Mr. Secretary, thank you very much for, for being here. Um, my dear senator, my dear friend, uh, Senator Landrieu, thank you very much for inviting me to be a part of this today. Um, as was noted, I represent Louisiana, the second congressional district, a district that is rich with natural gas, uh, a state that is rich with natural gas, uh, but a state that also requires attention when it comes to the relationship between industry and community. This is a step in the right direction. Uh, so thank you for inviting me for today's rollout of EFI's report on the role of natural gas and exports in the global stage. Um, the event brought together stakeholders from different sectors to talk about the position of natural gas following the Russian invasion. Uh, this severely disrupted our global energy markets and we have universally struggled to overcome diminishing energy supplies. At the same time, the threat of climate crisis demands energy solutions to address both vital security needs and important decarbonization goals as we prepare for renewable energy technologies to provide reliable, resilient, and affordable affordability to America's needs to meet its energy crisis, natural gas is a great step in the right direction. It's cleaner than, than coal and oil. It can help us through this transition. United States, the world's largest natural gas exporter, will play an instrumental role in this process. Recognizing the value of a transition that's pragmatic, that recognizes we have to do better than we've done and we have to pause long enough to recognize progress when we see it. This report demonstrates that there's progress. This represents a meeting of the minds of the best and the brightest, recognizing that something has to be different than how we've done it. We have to have cleaner, greener, safer ways to secure our, our nation. We have to have our internal dependencies on us and not on foreign entities. These are all things that make sense. These are all things that in its best form should be considered bipartisan. Republican, Democrat, black, white. It should be the discussion that we talk about when we mention how do we enhance our economies, 
clean and save our communities and pay attention to the people who are most impacted and unfortunately, historically, have been the least listened to. And that's the communities that live in the closest proximity to plants, to industrial um, uh, activities. Listening to the people and recognizing that coexistence is not a bad word. Recognizing that coming to the table and talking about these new technologies. Listen, natural gas in New Orleans is, is a big thing. In Louisiana, it's a big thing. We're quite proud of it. We're proud of, of our Gulf Coast. We're proud of the ability to have offshore wind. We're proud of the incredible work that Senator Landrieu did uh, for decades as a member of the US Senate, as a member of the state legislature in Louisiana, and the leadership that she's brought forward. So EFI's report today uh, means a lot. And we're very proud and very happy that you have come forward to share this. Uh, in, in my home state, Louisiana, has the third largest natural gas production and reserves among the states. We amount for 9% of the marketed natural gas production and hold about 8% of U.S. natural gas proved reserves. Additionally, Louisiana is the third largest natural gas consuming state and the second largest natural gas consumer per capita on a per capita basis. Natural gas generation is affordable and reliable which are my constituents' top concerns. Thanks to the extraordinary and swift advanced technology to locate, capture, and produce natural gas, there are now expanded opportunities to export LNG and possibilities to create, that's my time's up already. <laughs> high creating, next the music will start to play and then I'll get yanked off. But creating high paying jobs in America and support our allies in Europe and budding democracies across the world. That's a vote, it's okay. I'm used, I'm used to being interrupted by that sound, but I'll wait for you guys. Nowhere is this more evident than in my home state, Louisiana, and along the Gulf Coast, America's energy coast. The oil and gas industry supports over 300,000 jobs in Louisiana and has been a major factor in securing below average unemployment. But still, we can and must do better. Because we have to do it in a way that we are taking into account the community. We have to take into account the new technologies. We cannot continue to operate on the old mantra and be afraid of new technologies. We can't be afraid to enter the discussion of how do we do this better? Because we've got one world and we've got to do better with it. And we've got to continue to utilize the technologies. And Secretary, I, mean, I cannot thank you enough for, for your work in this space. Um, your, your expertise and, and noted passion uh, is greatly appreciated. Americans should be, America should be and can be an energy superpower in all aspects of conventional and advanced sources of energy, including new alternative fuels and alternative energy sources. We all know real competition in a real open market drives efficiency and lowers prices for everyone. The last thing Putin wants is competition from the United States and America and the energy race. Tyrants and dictators throughout history have had many reasons to fear revolutions, and this U.S. energy revolution is one they should keep their eyes on. I look forward to playing a role and to bring energy security independence to America and our democratic allies. Importantly, environmental justice must be at the center of any action to address disproportionate health and environmental impacts from natural gas distributors on commodities, especially communities of color. We must make environmental justice a reality. Clean air and safe drinking water, no matter what your zip code is. I want to take a moment to thank the thank Executive Director Rick Waterdale for the work he's doing to move all of us toward low carbon future. As a member of Congress, we must stay informed of the, of the challenges and opportunities surrounding the vital role of U.S. natural gas services in domestic and international energy securities and climate goals. I want to thank EFI for helping us remain educated for the unveiling of this report today. And thank all of you, stakeholders, uh, people who are at the table, people that have the energy, the commitment, and the knowledge to continue to strive for a better world and a better way of doing things. I will end as I started. We have one earth. 
We have won, and we have to be good stewards of it. As we're smart with our technology, we recognize the importance of industry, but industry means nothing without a healthy community. God bless you, and thank you for the opportunity. Okay, well, you're going to miss a, a whole bunch of them, right? Yeah. But I'll, we'll, we'll talk soon. Thank okay, thank you. Thank you all very much. And uh, thank you to the guests here today, to the sponsors of the study, to Congressman Carter, Senator Murkowski, and, and uh, Secretary Moniz, and to the EFI staff who have worked so hard to get this event together, get the study done, and uh, really thank you for your hard work. And um, so... It's already been mentioned that that uh, this is phase two of the study. The first phase, we, we did eight think tanks around the world and looked at the very different regional issues um, uh, and, and approaches to natural gas. And so this is phase two. And um, uh, as Secretary Moniz said, natural gas, global energy security, climate change need to be part of the same conversation. Uh, we're going to analyze the geostrategic value of natural gas for energy security and deep decarbonization. Um, I think that people, we're going to do a, a, a deep dive on Europe. Let me skip through this. A uh, deep dive on Europe and uh, Asia um, uh, that have been and are very reliant on U.S. natural gas. This workshop focused on U.S. production and the needs of the U.S. in order to meet those uh, needs of our allies and trading partners, and how important our domestic uh, industry is for, um, for meeting those, um, the needs, again, of our allies and trading partners. And uh, phase two, we're going to look at the implications of global and regional decarbonization, fuel switching from coal to natural gas for reducing greenhouse gas emissions. I'll say something about that in a second. Technologies needed for greenhouse gas emission abatement, uh, including CCS, hydrogen, methane, CO2 abatement, uh, energy efficiency, uh, renewable alternatives, and uh, including regional needs and variation. And then, uh, then do the deep dive on Asia and uh, Europe. And so um, I'm not going to go through the uh, key findings here. You've got them sitting in front of you on the table. Secretary Moniz has discussed them. Uh, briefly, what I'm going to do instead is take some of those findings and illustrate how we have developed baseline information on some of them and what the inquiries, what those that baseline data and et cetera, et cetera, suggest about the need for analyses that we're going to be doing and, and here in the very near future. Um, this is the, uh, uh, we've talked about um, uh, the energy security issues, and this addresses two uh, uh, of the uh, themes, key findings, climate goals and energy security, both affordability and availability of supply need to be addressed and, and be part of the same conversation, and the U.S. must shape its role in supplying natural gas while enabling uh, global decarbonization goals. What you're seeing here, this is year on year, year on year change. I can't, I gotta be able to see these things. Year on year change in Euro European natural gas imports and deliveries from Norway. So that was pipe gas uh, during the heating season and, um, and the LNG imports. What you see there, and that's, it's 21 to 20 to 20, 20, 21 to 2022 is what you're looking at here. Russian gas down 19, 22 BCM. Norway up 2 BCM. Others down. And look at this is stunning. United States was 19 BCM in that time period. The U.S. made up almost all of the difference in the, Rus in, in the loss of Russian gas. And so that's one huge reason why it's an energy security issue for our allies and trading partners, but also why we need to be uh, cognizant and mindful of our need to produce natural gas here at home. Uh, Gutter was up uh, 1 BCM and others up 7. So 
This is LNG supply demand balances, 2022, 23, and 24. And so this addresses climate goals and energy security and natural gas prices and how they uh, uh, affect uh, uh, global prices, et cetera, et cetera. And here are the different regions of the world, countries and regions of the world. And this is the demand is on the left-hand side. The supply, uh, I'm, I'm sorry, the supply is on the left-hand, demand is on the left-hand side, supply is on the right-hand side. What is amazing to me is in, this is 2022, it was only 11 million tons difference. Very, very tight year. But what's more amazing, look at 2023. It is a difference of 6 million tons. Very, very tight markets. I don't think people appreciate the implications of that for price. And 2% uh, in 2024, that's an outlook. OK, and there you see the demand. That's uh, Japan, Korea, and Taiwan. And up above that is Europe. Um, uh, when we started sending our LNG crisis, uh, Russia, Europe, to Europe, our friends and allies in Asia called us up and said, what about us? You can see why they are concerned. And I would say from a geostrategic perspective, the yellow there is North America, the blue, that is your, your supply, okay? The blue is Middle East and Africa. What, what I would suggest looking at those numbers and their need for supply in Asia, need for supply in Europe, we don't want to let Russia or, or other countries fill that gap because it has enormous geostrategic value for the United States. And we need to be very, very mindful that, that we need to keep supplying our allies and trading partners uh, going forward. A lot of concerns about price. Okay, this is um, uh, prices in January of 2023. And what's amazing, you see Europe there, TTF, $20, Asia, $24, US, $330. I think, uh, Secretary Moniz, you said today it's, what, $190 or something? I can't remember what the... It, but but, but the, I heard a lot of when, when prices went up temporarily while we were supplying our allies in Europe, oh, this is the, the companies gouging. Uh, uh, gouging American consumers. This is showing you what's happened in the world and what other consumers in the world are paying for natural gas. Our, our, our number is 330, uh, Asia $24. So, so um, uh, I, this uh, addresses natural gas would, will continue to be crucial in fulfilling global, glo global goals for decarbonization energy security, economic development, and food security. Food security was a big topic of discussion at the workshop, not something we'd really thought of much, and I don't think it has been analyzed much. We have identified an expert in, in uh, ammonia food, secu food security in the globe that we're gonna uh, hopefully solicit a white paper for as we move forward on this food security and other issue. But I also don't think people get the uh, issues here. I, the, the numbers are a little off there down below. But total CO2 emissions from natural gas and non-carbon uh, non generation in the electricity sector down uh, pretty substantially. I think it's about 8.2%. This, this is how those numbers break out. So the turquoise is emission reductions from the shift from gas to coal since 2005. Green is emission reductions from shift to non-carbon generation since 2005. 61% of U.S. emissions reductions in the power sector since 2005 have come from shifting to, from, from coal to gas. Obviously, the other 39% is from, from uh, non-carbon generation. That's not small. Okay, 39% is large, and, and renewables have grown. They're critical and important but so is a switch from coal to gas. And I'm going to give you one. This, uh, no, uh, yeah, yeah. It, uh, nuclear has actually gone down a little as a percentage, okay? And uh, it's, it's hydro, uh, 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 wind, and solar, okay? And so, so because uh, that was, uh, nuclear was already in the 2005 baseline. But one thing that, this is just a data point. 
I looked at two countries in 2018, India and China, two countries alone, coal generation under construction, plants under construction, not announced projects under construction, 165,000 megawatts of coal generation in two countries, India and China. That same year, our entire coal fleet was 235,000 megawatts. So two countries, one year under construction, 165,000 megawatts, our entire fleet 235. Just so you understand what's going on in the rest of the world and, and quite frankly, why we need carbon capture and sequestration. It's, it's, it's important here, but much more important globally uh, for reasons I just um, talked about. This is, uh, uh, discusses natural gas would continue to be crucial for filling global goals for decarbonization, energy security, economic development. And this is an industrial uh, 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 slide that people are not thinking about. And I will say that this is wind turbine blades. Wind turbine blades are manufactured using a composite mix of glass, carbon fiber, and plastic. Okay, plastic, we know plastic is made from fossil fuels. But another point I wanted to make here, what you see in this little graphic over there on the right, carbon fibers require 2,800 degrees centigrade of heat. Okay, and I know there are technologies being worked on to develop a, a high quality process heat from, from that does not require a fuel like you require fuels here. Um, and and uh, there are process changes being considered that would lower temperature needs, but huge need for high quality process heat. We are currently getting that from fuel. Right now that fuel is largely natural gas, oil, and could be hydrogen in the future, but 2,800 degrees centigrade, the ceramics, need 2,200 degrees centigrade. The technologies I've looked at that are under development, 2,000 degrees, that's what they're focused on. Okay, so it doesn't, uh, doesn't address carbon fibers or the uh, ceramics and other things. I think steel's 1,700 to 1,900 degrees. And don't quote me on that because I forgot my notes, okay? But, um, but it's, it's under the 2,000 degree threshold, but not by much. And so in my view, New technologies, they will take a long time to develop and deploy. And, and uh, just so you know, I saw a major headline the other day, big breakthrough, electricity can provide 400 degrees centigrade heat. Okay, so huge role that natural gas plays in industry in the US and around the world for high quality process heat. It says to me another reason why you need carbon capture and sequestration right now because you need to, those are all emitting and we need to uh, capture the emissions. Um, there was a big discussion of uh, methane, very open discussion of methane at the workshop. And I was su not surprisingly, the industry uh, players all said, we need to capture our methane, okay? And, and we need uh, more regulations to address methane from gas systems. What you're looking at here is global methane emissions and where the anthropogenic, where they're coming from. And so here, here you see uh, uh, energy and natural gas emissions, methane emissions, 12.4% of total methane emissions in the world, 12.4. And agriculture, 30, 40%, okay, in the world. I'll show you US wetlands, are, those are natural emissions and not anthropogenic. These are U.S. methane emissions. So agriculture's lower, not surprisingly, in the U.S. than in the world, but not that much, 40, 35 to 40. Natural gas systems, much higher than in the, the rest of the world, 12% in the world and, and almost 23% uh, almost here. So we need to focus on gas systems. We also need technologies. Methane is a large problem, uh, major issue, technologies for methane from agriculture, et cetera, et cetera. They're out there, we need to spend some time on them. Um, emissions increased from agriculture in the US by 6.5% since uh, 1990. Emissions from gas systems have gone down almost 16% because of regulations and technologies that we already have. Um, I, I was surprised about agriculture, we just like beef and that's what it said. Um, uh, 
just a, I think this is the last slide, permitting times, okay, and state, federal, local uh, permitting issues, hugely important. One of the major findings, climate goals and energy security need to be addressed in the same conversation, and we need to speed this up. This is for wind turbines, okay, a wind farm. And what you're seeing there are the different reviews and the number of days. So when you look at those reviews and to, when you get to construction, it's about five years, but there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight processes up there that are a quarter of a year, half a year, three years going on simultaneously. So, so um, big, big issue, 3.1 3 years to get to uh, construction. Uh, again, seven reviews, five years from the start of the process to construction. And I found that had a good breakdown. I couldn't find as good a breakdown for gas pipelines. I did find pipelines here. And what you see there, time from notice to decision for a gas pipeline is five years. So, so, um, so we need to speed up both of these in order to meet the global needs that I showed you earlier and to meet our deep decarbonization goals from things like wind and, and solar. So just a few um, uh, uh, numbers to uh, illustrate what we found and where we're going to be going. So thank you all very much. And, oh, oh and, and next is Dave Goldwyn. Okay, he's going to talk about um, Europe, and Jane Nagano is going to talk about Asia, some specific focus. Okay. Thanks, Melanie, and always a pleasure to, to work with Ernie and Joe and Melanie and, and Rick and to be part of the phase one of the, the global gas study. Uh, David Goldwyn, uh, affiliated with uh, EFI and the Atlantic Council. So I'm going to talk about Europe, and I think you've heard three important contextual uh, elements about uh, Europe and gas, um, which will frame my remarks. Um, clearly, Russia's invasion of Ukraine transformed the flows of natural gas around the world, but it was really also a transformation in Europe's policy um, and, and perspective on the role of natural gas. And I think the energy pragmatism that Ernie talked about is, uh, is really um, is very salient now. The three contextual things you've heard, uh, one is that um, gas is a strategic commodity for, for Europe. It's not just about electricity. It's also heat. It's industrial demand. It's the service economy, uh, which makes it very hard to replace in those sectors. Second, it is an enormous gas market. And uh, I think they used 390 billion cubic meters of gas in 2023 shaved a little bit of that for efficiency. It's a lot of gas to replace. Um, and prior to the war, the Europeans imported about 155 billion cubic meters of gas from Russia. So trying to get that to zero for a lot of sectors is a lot of gas. And just by way of comparison, you'd have to devote a third of the entire globally traded LNG just to Europe in order to replace that Russian gas. So it's a lot. So in terms of the Europeans' perspective um, on natural gas, we don't have to speculate. President von der Leyen has been uh, here to meet with President Biden. Dita Jorgensen has been here back and forth several times over the last year. Vice President Sefcovic was here for the meeting of the US-EU Energy Council and the US-EU Task Force on Energy Security earlier this month. Europeans are crystal clear on what their strategy is. It's got two elements. One is they are intensely focused on accessing gas for the short and medium term. And second, they are doubling down on their commitment to the energy transition in order to reduce their dependence on natural gas even though they know they're going to be um, importing significant quantities for decades to come. So I'll talk first about the short and medium term strategy. So in terms of diversification, the first thing we want to do is get off of dependence on Russian gas. They still use about 20%. They're down from 40% of their imports coming from Russia to 20%. That's still a big number, especially if it gets cut off. Um, so they managed to cut their, um, uh, Russia cut its exports before the war. It started draining storage, and then it cut off supply. And obviously, it's gone down since. So they're down to 20%. Their repower EU plan envisages, envisages eliminating Russian gas imports by 2027. Given the amount of infrastructure, which I'll talk about in a second, that is a really ambitious goal and probably unlikely that they're going to meet it. But their view, you know, because they, they, they're doubling down on the energy transition as well, is that everything that they do by way of pipelines and terminals and storage is also potentially able to be used or repurposed for hydrogen supply over the long term or rerouted to other regions or used to make blue hydrogen. So they don't see these as inconsistent. The other thing they're doing, obviously, is diversifying supply. Norway, the US, and Qatar are the top three suppliers. But Norway is capped pretty much by infrastructure and by supply. Qatar's supply, they can do a little bit more 
going forward, but their contracts are all oil-linked and fixed destination. So Europe would be locked into that supply and couldn't redirect it. So this is why they are particularly grateful for U.S. supply, both in terms of the volume, but also in terms of the contract model. So I think you've heard some of the stories about how helpful we have been. Um, uh, by 2022, U.S. Uh, exports, LNG exports had tripled, and we were a key part of filling their, their storage. I think we provided 50% of their LNG supply in 2022, and, there, and the, the U.S. EU Task Force on Energy Security has as a target 50 BCM in the year to come. But they're particularly grateful for the contract model, because while they managed to, to take, I think, almost a, a third of the LNG spot market in 2022, most of what they got was redirected from other suppliers. And it is the U.S. contract model, free of destination clauses, and also linked to hub pricing, which allowed the supply, which largely came from South Korea and Japan and China, to be redirected to Europe. And so I think the Chinese supply was almost, the redirected Chinese LNG was 7% of Europe's imports. So it was a big number. Um, they're also trying to aggregate supplies from Algeria, um, Azerbaijan, um, some of their own supply, and in the future maybe from, from Cyprus, Africa, and the Eastern Med. But it's not going to be enough. And so, more, as you heard before, warm winters, weak demand in Asia allowed all this supply to be redirected, but serendipity is not a strategy. They are going to need more supply and they're going to need more demand constraint. So their second pillar is new infrastructure, and that's because Central and Eastern Europe are basically infrastructure deserts. And so it's very hard in countries like Moldova and Czechia and Slovenia and Slovakia to Bulgaria to get supply there really from, from anywhere. So you've got multiple LNG imports, terminals uh, under construction, a bunch in Germany, but also in the Baltics and in Greece. They're looking at more interconnections um, between countries so they can get to, to Central and Eastern Europe. And they are working on permitting. They're trying to get their shot clock, on some, shot clock down to two years in some cases, a year in other, other cases. But permitting, financing, electricity, market design, these are all enormous headwinds for, for the Europeans. So I guess what that tells me is that while they're focused on the short and medium term, the medium term could be a long time. Um, and so Europe expects to be importing gas from the U.S. for a while. And last year they signed up for 9 million tons in new long-term supply contracts, 6 million in 2021. We're seeing those contracts for shorter terms. They're 15 years rather than 20 years. And that's because Europe thinks it's going to need a lot of gas for the next 15 years and less afterwards. And, um, but the, the, re, the realization is that um, once they get through sort of a reaching conclusion on what infrastructure they're going to build in the next six months to two years, they're looking at 195 BCM a year in new import capacity. So they're going to need supply for that, and they're going to be looking forward to us. The second big piece of what they're doing is doubling down on the energy transition. And they have been crystal clear that they are going to accelerate the deployment of renewables and implement strategies to, to reduce the amount of gas they consume and also to reduce the carbon intensity of the gas that they purchase over time. So for them, the energy transition isn't really just a climate issue. It's an existential issue. It's an energy security issue. So it's very much both and. And all of these, these efforts at diversification still leave them at least 45 BCM short of what they're going to need. So they have a grand strategy. It's codified in three big initiatives, Fit for 50, Repower EU, and the EU Green Deal and Net Zero Industry Act. It's looking at increasing renewables, carbon capture, hydrogen deployment, electrifying mobility. Energy efficiency and conservation play really enormous roles. Just last year, between August 22 and January 2023, they reduced their overall natural gas demand by 19%. Now, some of that was conservation policy, and some of that was deindustrialization. That was that was high prices, which they just couldn't really afford to buy it. But they are they are they are big on energy efficiency. Their Repower EU plan projects that gas demand could decline by over 52 percent from 2019 levels by 2030. That would still leave over 200 BCM in demand. There's plenty of gas, even if they meet that target. But there are enormous error bars on whether they're going to meet any of these targets. And and BP's energy outlook had the range by 2030 as, you know, LNG imports between 93 and 186 BCM. That's a big range. 2050 was 30 to 200 BCM. So really, it's a very ambitious plan, um, and they're trying to re replace a lot of gas, um, and they have to get through a lot of infrastructure. And, um, and even though they can repurpose it, it's very uncertain. And this uncertainty is why you see a lot of the muddled rhetoric frankly, coming from the European Union when it comes to natural gas. The G7 statement, which just came out, is we like supply for where it's needed. 
And that's because they really don't know and they hope they're not going to need it, but they want to be hedged. And so, um, so I think that's, that, that, that's their challenge. In terms of what this means for the future, they're going to see the United States as a core pillar of their energy security. And for the short term, they're going to sign up for more supply and get as much as they can. And their uncertainty means that we're going to see, I think, shorter term, long, you know, long term contracts than we might otherwise expect. But the other factor is that after 2027, they're going to have a carbon border adjustment mechanism. So when new supply comes online, Qatar and other places, and, uh, and they have that policy in place, there's going to be a premium on low emissions gas. And I think the US industry is aware of this. There are a multitude of initiatives. There's the Veritas from GTI. Every major exporter has their own MRV program. So industry knows that this is the future. And so I think it's, it's going to be important because for the US, this can be a competitive advantage in a world which is, which is very carbon conscious. And so um, you know, the, there's a little bit of complacency going on right now because prices are low. But winter is coming for, for Europe, and there is a serious demand risk there, serious risk really, that they won't be able to access the supply that they need. Um, and so uh, as they struggle with needing supply, trying to do the, the carbon, uh, the carbon uh, uh, you know, decarbonization programs, and paying an enormous amount of subsidies to help people meet their bills, they know that the current model isn't really sustainable. And so as we look at how do we harmonize these three initiatives, the need to continue investment in the LNG space, the need for the US and for Europe to meet the, their decarbonization goals, the one place all three of those parties are united is on low emissions gas. If industry meets its commitments for methane leakage and detection and mitigation, um, and we have a system where people can credibly believe they know what the carbon footprint of our gas is, we've got a big market in the future and we can accomplish all those goals. Thank you so much. Uh, thank you to Secretary Moniz and all the friends and colleagues at EFI for having me. So I have three, I guess, key um, uh, points I'd like to share with everyone here as we look at how Asia is uh, looking at this evolving a global LNG landscape. The first one is that I think the region's experiences with the LNG market uh, have been fairly uh, diverse. I mean, there are some countries such as Malaysia and Indonesia and Brunei that have been traditionally regional suppliers of LNG to other markets uh, within Asia Pacific. Um, but at the same time, you know, the region does have uh, some of the, the largest LNG importing countries such as Japan and Korea. I mean, total, uh, you know, 60 percent of uh, global LNG supply last year went to Asia, while 30, about 30 percent went to Europe. Um, you know, all five uh, top importers are um, from Asia, but there's quite a bit of a diversity, as I uh, mentioned, and, and and especially when it comes to countries such as China, whose appetite really affects um, the future of the global LNG supply and demand picture. We really cannot underestimate how uh, these individual governments uh, assess uh, what the current LNG market and to some extent what you know, Europe is trying to do may affect their uh, energy strategy as well as decarbonization uh, strategies. Um, the second one is that uh, the key uh, observation message is that the effects of the Russian uh, uh, invasion on, on Europe and the Russian-induced you know, energy crisis on Asia has been fairly underappreciated, uh, although they're as real as they are, uh, the, the effects on Europe. You know, when it comes to countries such as uh, uh, Japan and Korea, um, you know, they were able to afford high LNG prices but uh, according to the, the, um, the statement that just came out of Japan's Minister of Finance, the Japanese uh, fossil fuel import expenditure went up by 96.8%. Uh, that was huge, huge increase over the, the, their fiscal year uh, that ended in March of 2022. So their fiscal year runs from April to, to March. Um, you know, I mean, in that, the background of that was, you know, as Melanie pointed out, it's roughly, I guess, $24 per um, million BTU. But 
in you know right before the Russian invasion, it was roughly around uh, twenty dollars. The JKT um, uh, marker was roughly twenty dollars. A month later, in March, it went up to eighty four eighty four point seven dollars. Then, in the the high energy demand uh, month of August, uh, it was still seventy dollars. And Mostly, you know, the Japanese and Korean industry, and then, and I guess Taiwanese uh, industrial part uh, stakeholder, uh, you know, had to make adjustment. But they did continue to consume, um, where the, you know, the, in the areas that they were not able to really conserve the the, um, the LNG or you know, gas demand. But in South Asia, the effect was quite different. Um, the LNG prices, high LNG prices led to about 16.5% drop uh, in their LNG imports uh, in 2022, over 2021 uh, 20, uh, level. And the, that uh, marked the first um, decline, annual decline in South Asia's LNG imports since 2013. That, um, you know, led to a higher uh, coal uh, consumption uh, within South Asia. Uh, then coal import jumped by about 12% uh, in 2022. When we look at the specific countries, you know, we've actually read quite a bit about, uh, for example, Pakistan, basically just scratching uh, natural gas uh, as part of their decarbonization pathway and announced that they would be quadrupling their coal-fired uh, power capacity, um, uh, capacity going forward. And, and completely really scratching natural gas-based uh, uh, thermal uh, power plant um, power plant plan that they they previously had, um, and also in countries like Bangladesh, uh, we've seen uh, local uh, the, the you know citizens just becoming quite fed up with the power shortages, um, and that led to uh, protests and and really the quite a bit of pressure on governments, uh, you know and. So in many ways, it was not just the energy security issue. It became much more about domestic stability and to some extent in parts of the, the Asia, more of a, um, something that could uh, have had greater effect on the regional stability. But also, as uh, David mentioned, and I think quite a, you know, um, you know China has come up a few times already, but you know, it, in, in many ways, China's uh, very strict COVID policy uh, was a blessing, uh, if I may say so. Um, you know, the China's LNG demand dropped by 20% last year, uh, even though they continue to import uh, pipeline natural gas from Russia. But, you know, having China, uh, China's uh, appetite uh, to be uh, somewhat, um, uh, I guess, uh, moderated last year, I think it allowed the global LNG market to stay uh, or be able to somewhat meet many of the requirements that uh, industrialized Europe and uh, others had. The, so it was sort of a lucky factor, but at the same time, you know, China's uh, zero COVID policy has been lifted. Uh, it's not, I think there's a range of uh, assessments as to how quickly and how robustly China's uh, LNG appetite may come back. But that certainly is one of the major variables uh, that we need to keep an eye on as we try to figure out what sort of impact um, or how the, the global uh, LNG supply and demand uh, picture balance may look like in this uh, this year, certainly uh, in the, the cold winter months uh, later this year. Just quickly also about the G7, it was really interesting to see the back and forth between uh, mainly, mainly the chair country, Japan, and many of the other uh, G7 members over the role of fossil fuels, uh, including natural gas. Um, you know, there was a considerable, uh, I, uh, I think, discussion over the best balance between uh, energy security and decarbonization. And I think, you know, I've, I've heard Secretary Moniz uh, mention this at many places. I can't agree more in the, uh, the fact that it's a dual challenge. You can't address, you can't fix one without fixing really the other. But it, it was really interesting to see how some of the, the uh, Japanese push for greater recognition that a natural gas is, needs to be more active uh, uh, solution to the energy security, uh, met quite a bit of a pushback. I think when the Japanese tried to stress that point, that captured many of the other uh, Asian economies' concerns about the uncertainty over 
uh, whether you know, uh, Europe can really uh, further um, cut back on its gas appetite and also where that gas uh, supply, uh, LNG supply may be coming from. Uh, you know, watching Germany busy uh, signing long-term LNG contract with Qataris, et cetera. Um, it, you know, I think a lot of the Asian governments that want to see or could have uh, LNG or, in, or natural gas being part of their energy security, but then also decommunization pathways to have to sort of make much more conservative assumptions going forward. Um, and as I think as the report uh, has mentioned, I think for the industrialized Asia, the concern is about availability. Uh, for the developing Asia, it's much more about affordability. And I think you know, it's, it's, it sort of becomes a bit of a question of equity as well uh, between the global south and, and many of the economies that can afford gas. And the last point quickly is that it, you know, I, you know, when um, following David, uh, you know, it's, um, discussion here by, I, you know, it's, I'd be remiss if I don't stress how I think in Asia, you know, there is virtually no aversion to gas, um, if I may say so. Um, I think there is definitely a focus on um, the negative attributes. I mean, and, you know, no one wakes up one day and say, well, I like coal because, you know, <laughs> uh, but, you know, whether it's coal or gas, I think, you know, they really want to first serve the needs of the people. Uh, population, but there is a growing awareness. They want natural gas to be part of their solution, but then there is a concern, the security of supply being a big concern. Um, and But for some countries like Japan and Korea, natural gas is very much part of their uh, energy outlook, um, with uh, you know, nuclear being always a bit of a, a tough piece uh, as you know, government changes in South Korea or in Japan's case, they're still a bit of a challenge uh, in the convincing public that a nuclear could have a robust future. For countries like China and India, again, it's really, you know, coal has such a strong staying power, but they're investing quite heavily in renewables as well. But once I think there's a greater sense of security of supply uh, for, uh, from the gas market, including from the United States, I think we could see much um, uh, better articulation of where natural gas could be in their strategy. And, and just to you know, emphasize, I think um, their focus is much less on the feedstocks. And I think that was quite evident in, the, in the, some of the discussions around hydrogen as well, uh, whereas Europe is very much you know, interested in uh, distinguishing uh, hydrogen, you know, acceptable clean hydrogen by feedstocks. I think a lot of Asian economies are much more open to looking at the emissions intensity as determinant of what the market wants to supply and what the consumers want to consume. Um, but let me end there. And thank you so much. Excellent. Thanks, Jane. Thanks, David, for that uh, European and Asian perspective. We're going to shift gears for a moment. I'm Rick Westerdale, Executive Director at EFI. And I've got the great pleasure of moderating a panel discussion, a panel discussion that brings uh, a different set of perspectives, one from industry, one from the financial sector, and one from the NGOs. LG, thanks for joining us. You bet, um, I'm very fortunate to have with me here, uh, seated next to me, I have Octavio Simois, uh, who is here, uh, <laughs> CEO of Tellurian, to provide the industry perspective. I have LG Holstein, uh, Senior Director for Strategic Planning at EDF. And joining us virtually is Ed Morris, the Managing Director and Global Head of Commodity Research at Citigroup. So we're gonna start by hearing a few remarks from Ed, and then we'll come back to the panel, please. I'd like to share with you today some observations on the energy transition, and in particular, the energy transition and natural gas. By background, what do we know about the energy transition? What we know about the energy transition is that the world is set up to try to get rid of emissions of methane, emissions of carbon dioxide, and these emissions essentially come from fossil fuels. So uh, when people got uh, deeply interested in getting to an energy transition to arrive at a net zero emissions world, uh, they decided to start this out by getting rid of fossil fuels. Um, and that's all well and good, uh, except uh, if you're starting from a blank slate, we've already discovered that 
just getting rid of fossil fuels is not the easiest thing to do in the world. We tend to think of these problems in terms of three letter R words and one letter A word. The three letter R words are a power system needs to be resilient. It needs to be able to stand up against hurricane force winds or tornadoes and be able to get back into business kind of quickly. It needs not only resilience, it needs reliability so that you're gonna have it available uh, when you need it, day and night. And finally, as we know, in a world moving away from fossil fuels, we need redundancy in the system. Uh, and that redundancy almost certainly needs a reliance on something other than a non-fossil fuel for reasons that I'll get into in a minute. And finally, we have to think of the letter A, affordability. How do you make this affordable, not only for people in advanced economies, but for people in emerging market countries? So the challenge really to make people happy uh, and not revolt against the transition, which as I said, is a revolutionary process, doing away with 150 to 200 years of a historical economic model of how to provide power uh, to growing populations and to do that in a 30 year period to get this done by uh, 2050. So natural gas, it turns out, is critically important. Uh, the problem with natural gas is we have sentiment against, uh, against financing it. And even now Europe, which has decided to cut their reliance on natural gas by 15% overnight, and they've done that through conservation, among other things, through shutting of energy intensive industry, they're still liable to the problems of a lack of hydropower, particularly as so many countries in Europe are shutting down their nuclear power. So they need the reliance on natural gas. They're getting it to the degree they can, not on the 20 years that you really need to finance new liquefaction, and to finance new regasification, uh, they're trying to do it on a 10 year period of time. And the finance issue is a problem. Now Europe is lucky, there are, uh, there are practical ways of, of, of not just buying, uh, but leasing uh, regasification facilities that are floating. They are trying to build some more. They're lucky that there are companies that are not starting from scratch that are building on top of existing equipment and they can rely on uh, doing a 10 year project uh, and not a longer project than that. So they can go ahead and say, okay, we're gonna rely on natural gas a little bit longer than we wanted, uh, but we're gonna wait uh, a, a good 10 years in which time we believe that technology we will, will be at work uh, through two mechanisms so that we can get the reliability and the redundancy and the two mechanisms are better battery power than we have now. That is to say battery power that will last more than eight or 12 or 24 hours, but battery power that can last 30 days or 60 days. And this can be done with new technological breakthroughs and it can be done uh, with hydrogen and it can be done with natural gas uh, by spending the money and having the natural gas in storage. When we look at emerging market countries uh, and an unwillingness uh, of most uh, private sector companies to uh, engage in a 20 year process, which is needed to finance projects on the regas side and on the liquefaction side that can cost on each side as much as $20 billion to put in place. Uh, so with people uh, being reluctant and banks are reluctant and businesses are reluctant to take that 20 year risk. We need some mechanism at work where that risk is taken by a party uh, that will be able to absorb uh, the getting off of natural gas uh, prematurely. Uh, so we need, uh, we need either a reform of the World Bank or we need multilateral lending institutions that are focused uh, only on infrastructure uh, needed for the energy transition. And among that infrastructure is regasification facilities uh, for natural gas. Uh, so we need to think about how to finance that. We need to think about how to get these mechanisms in place, knowing that we need to rely on the cleanest fossil fuels possible to get through the energy transition in a, a peaceful way, not a way that creates rebellion at home 
and uh, and has an international uh, irritation to it uh, as well. Um, uh, and the world is equipped to do it. So uh, we think at COP28 uh, that comes out uh, next uh, fall and winter in uh, in the United Arab Emirates, there will be critical thinking about how to get a peaceful energy transition and have, how to do that relying more significantly on the cleanest fossil fuels that are available that happen to be natural gas. To transition to my panelists that are here beside me and give each of them an opportunity to provide their perspectives before we do a uh, round of Q&As. So with that, Octavia, if I can uh, let you, if you will, here you go. Go down, okay. Thank you, and good afternoon, everyone. So first of all, my apologies for not being here since the beginning at this event with President Yoon of Korea. And uh, although I did leave my panel and halfway through to be here, so <laughs> Rick, I, I promise not to do that um, on this one. Look, I like to, um, this is a very complex problem, but sometimes made too simple, sometimes made it worse than what it is. So one of the things that I think helps us get us on the same page and have a pragmatic and constructive conversation is to start with basic elements. And I like to start with this balance that we're trying to achieve between environmental performance, not just CO2 and methane, as I keep hearing it, but also air pollution and land and water use. We balance environmental performance with energy supply, which is critical, uh, along with food and water. Obviously, those are the three key things we have to do. Uh, and that means that it's got to be there, and it cannot be intermittent. It's got to be reliable. And then we balance the third part of the triangle there, the third vertex, with uh, economy. Is it economical or not? So if we start then looking at these aspects, and we say that, OK, 18% of the population today consumes 40% of the world's energy, and the other 82% want to increase their standard of living, and rightfully so, for better. Not, we're not talking about driving a Cadillac Escalade to pick up a gallon of milk. We're talking about simple access to clean water and medical attention and education and the ability of generations to grow. So that has to be taken into account because they don't really care about the climate change. They care about, do I actually have energy that I can survive and my kids can go to school? And they're not going to wait 25 years for the luminaries of the Western world to figure out what they can do. They're doing exactly what they need to do today. So that's the economic. On the energy side, we forget one very simple thing. We always talk about electrification. The electrical sector is 25 to 30% of the total energy sector. We forget that the rest, and I know there's reports, the one that just got published, talks about the importance of hydrocarbons in processing, even for those renewable energies, whether it's polysilicate, whether it's, it's, it's graphite, whether it's anything you can think of um, that has to require process and temperatures. I like to think of, I always say, the difference between energy delivered by electrons or molecules. Ernie keeps correcting me. He's a physics professor. I go with this definition. It's electrons and fuel. <laughs> so so and we, when we look at the map of the world and we look at what are the cities within 1,000 miles of strong wind and, and solar resources, there's a big gap where the world is growing and where half the population lives. And that's why they're burning everything they can get. That's why Pakistan decided, I'm not going to go do my gas plants. I'm going to build coal plants, quadruple, as Jane just mentioned. That's why the Indonesian government committed in the Paris Accord to shut down their coal plants, and the next day permitted more coal plants than the ones they committed to shut down, and they're being built with Chinese financing. That, I'll give you even a worse anecdote. That's why BMW moved their production of Mini Coopers that are electric cars from the UK to China so they can build them on coal power and be cheaper. Think of that one. We're building electric cars on coal power. And then there's this thing that I take a lot of cues from, from Ernie, which is called arithmetic is daunting. So if you think of electric vehicles, we basically have 1.4 billion cars in the world. We add about 75 million cars every year. We retire 25 million. Tesla just announced that they hope to be able to produce a little over a million cars this year. We're talking about 75 million cars. So the whole notion that by 2035, like the state that I live in, you can no longer buy electric uh, gasoline-powered car. But by the way, you can go to Arizona and Nevada and buy one and bring it over. But you cannot buy it in California, which is a reduction in sales tax. 
But that's, that's where we're missing the point of actually making things better. So let's focus on what can we do to make it better. 21 had more coal emissions than any year before, 22 more than 21, 23 is going to be more than 22. We're going the wrong way. So what's the role of natural gas? Unfortunately, the Russian invasion of Ukraine kind of distorted the reality of how much of an energy crisis the whole world was in, in terms of supply. Forget just supply of gas, supply of anything. We were in a shortage that was structural. What Russia did by invading Ukraine is completely collapse the European strategy that they were going to rely on Russian gas until they no longer needed it, which is obviously did not work because they closed the spigot before the Europeans were happy and prepared for it. An interesting thing is the price went up, not as a result of the way the natural LNG was being sold, because the LNG from most of the production in the United States was being sold on the contracts at anywhere up plus two or three dollars, which basically would have been LNG at eight, nine dollars on the, on the boat. Yet it was being sold in Europe at 60 and 80 dollars. Who was making that money? By the way, that's funny. It's mostly European companies, because they were the ones lifting out of the US and taking the opportunity of delivering it to Europe as opposed to taking it somewhere else where they had planned. The end result is the rest of the world saw an increase in price, and Pakistan happened, and other things happened. So that's going to become in balance only if we do investment. So what we've seen is a narrative and the rhetoric that doesn't go together. In fact, they don't go together. So for a while, financing was, no, we're not going to invest in fossil fuels, not realizing fossil fuels is not just electricity. It's a lot of other things that you need to do, for which today you have no replacement. Yes, we need a fuel. Is it hydrogen? I hope so at one point in the future. By the way, it's not hydrogen in, ga in natural gas pipes because it doesn't work. But So let's stop that narrative once and for all. Or that LNG facilities can be converted to hydrogen. No, you cannot. Ma oh, sorry, you can repurpose uh, the administration building, as I like to put it. So the point is, you have to really think through what can be done and what makes sense. The methane issue, to me, is a red herring. I, my company, we produce natural gas. We have zero tolerance for methane leaks. We do not flare. We actually just installed integrated compressors in pipelines that are just like using deep water exploration, first time in the United States. It has no leaks, magnetic bearings. You can do it. It's a plumbing problem. It's a red herring. Fix it. End the story. And we're all supportive of a methane fee. Make it as big as you want because we can fix the problem. It's not an issue. Think, it, like I said, it's a red herring on the methane. And then you can deal with the rest of the inventory. So when you look at something that you can actually accomplish, LNG can do it. Recently, we saw European banks that we had never seen come in big time to financing fossil fuels in the United States. Banks that had been out of the picture all of a sudden came in. $20 billion just got into debt for Plaquemines project. That's unheard of. There's no equity. It's $20 billion of, of debt alone for one LNG facility. So they're coming back. We're in the process ourselves. We're talking to a lot of banks. As a matter, and then we have this other, I'll give you another anecdote. NG and RWE, and I can say this because it was shared with a group of us in Singapore in February, NG and RWE had contracts with Semper for Port Arthur project, which just took FID, as you may know. In the beginning, they were going to do electric drives in order to be able to access wind and solar electricity. They told Semper, forget that. We want natural gas compressors because we want the project online as soon as possible. They had 15 and 20 year contracts. They're going to live with that, those emissions for that period of time. You have this distortion between what's said in public because it's acceptable and what people do in actual fact. I've never said across from anyone in Asia that said, please sell me LNG cheaper or I'm going to build a wind and solar facility. It's always, if I don't get LNG, I'm going to burn oil, coal, wood, or even worse, animal waste for indoor cooking. And this is where, I, sorry, I'm going to get on my soapbox here a little bit. Yeah, this is it. This is, <laughs> this is what I get really upset. You have three million kids under the age of three with cataracts because of indoor cooking. You have 50% of kids in Nepal dying at the, at, below the age of 10 with respiratory disease. Where is the outrage over this fact? It's, it's so, look, I, I'm going to stop there because I get excited about these things and I got passion as you can tell. But LNG has a role, but so does everything else. We need everything. We need all the wind and solar. We need to change the supply chain so that we don't go from OPEC over 11, 12 countries to China because they process all the rare minerals, most of it. We need to diversify. And if you didn't read it, there's an op-ed piece that Ernie did 
a couple of years ago in the Wall Street Journal, I think there was, where he talks about the solution is regional. And Africa is gonna have its own solution, Asia is gonna have its own solution, Europe is gonna have its solution in the US. We cannot say one size fits all to make the decarbonization process. I'll stop there, thank you. I was trying to stay young, okay, <laughs> uh, Thank you for those remarks, LG. I uh, appreciate you uh, joining us today. Let's see if we can get that. Yeah, this is okay. Perfect. You bet. Thank you. Uh, and uh, and good afternoon, everybody. I, I think the, the normal uh, wet blanket role for an environmental organization is to <laughs> come to meetings like this and uh, immediately launch into a debate with everyone about how long it's going to take us to phase out fossil fuels. When should we phase out fossil fuels? Will it ever happen? And I'm betting that every single person in this room has their own separate answer to that question. So I'm not going near it, uh, because what I want to talk about is what can we do right now, and what are the expectations we need to uh, impose not only upon ourselves, but on the rest of the world as well, for as long as we use natural gas, for as long as we use natural gas. I don't have to tell this audience that natural gas, uh, when leaked into the methane, when leaked into the atmosphere, is damaging, um, that it's responsible for about 25% of the warming that we're experiencing right now, and that it is uh, a, a short term, uh, powerful uh, forcer of, of uh, climate change. And so, um, for us, that does not translate into an automatic opposition to natural gas, but rather an emphasis on two things. First, let's accelerate the kinds of things that Ed Morse was talking about, and I think the Inflation Reduction Act uh, does a lot of that, not only by creating incentives, but also by pouring lots more money into the kind of research and development we need uh, to bring about uh, CCS, to bring about perhaps hydrogen, bring about other alternatives. And of course, uh, Melanie uh, alone has stood as the number one critic of storage. And uh, she and I have been debating this for about five years now. So, <laughs> But I'm with Ed Moore still. I think these batteries can do a lot better than they're doing now. And I applaud the work that's being done. But the second major bucket, of course, is what can we do to get a handle on the methane that is leaking? Um, how do we find out more about why it leaks and where to go look for it in a way that is cost effective, in a way that uh, helps improve the accuracy of the surveying work that we do? It doesn't serve anybody's purpose to simply say what we need to do is just put methane detection equipment on every single, you know, 18 inches of pipeline or on every export facility or on every single piece of equipment uh, in the oil and gas value chain. That is not the way to do this. Uh, we're all celebrating and getting giddy over, over, um, uh, uh, over chat GPT. We ought to be able to we're still trying to figure out what to do with it. I've got a great idea. Let's start using that technology to answer some of these questions so that we can address the predictive side that can save everyone money and bring to bear the best technology possible to, uh, to find and fix leaks and uh, whenever possible to prevent them in the, in the first place. And on this subject, I think uh, we're, we constantly are learning more. Uh, we're learning, for example, that um, uh, a small leak one day can be a much larger leak the next day, um, which means that, that you're going to have to have an approach to your survey work that takes into account the fact that there is uh, a lack of information right now uh, to tell you whether or not you need to come back to that spot, uh, and, and if so, how frequently. Last night, I was looking at some detailed information from a major city in the United States. Uh, this data were, were way over my head, but I got the gist of it. And the gist of it was that 
in the uh, older cities of the United States with older distribution systems, there's all, kind of, all kinds of leaking going on. Well, we've known that for over 10 years when EDF did our first joint experiment with uh, Google Street View in which we put Picaro uh, methane detectors on the front of their street mapping cars and drove around 10 cities in the United States. It was very rough. It was, by today's standards, a primitive kind of survey. But it did tell us something about the scale of the problem and the need to uh, tremendously dial up the uh, attention being paid to both the technology and the methodology of going after methane leakage in our existing and in our future natural gas systems. Further in this data last night were some very interesting uh, pieces of information about the disproportionate impacts in communities. Uh, specifically, we learned that uh, in many places, uh, particularly lower income places, the um, amount of citizen input into the, into the, back to the feedback, back to the distribution company, is often much more limited than it is elsewhere. Let me put a number on that. About 80% of the, uh, of the calls to fix, excuse me, of the efforts to fix leaks on distribution systems in the United States are the result of people individual citizens picking up the phone and calling in to their distribution facility saying, I smell gas. Uh, I actually have experienced that in my own neighborhood, a, 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 a little uh, track that I run on, and there's a natural gas main nearby, and you smell it every time you run by it. In low-income neighborhoods, that 80% drops dramatically because and this is just a theory um, on the part of the people who are doing some of this data collection, because there are people in the community who are apprehensive about calling a distribution company with which they may have had disagreements in the past. They may have been late with their bills. They may be late paying their bill. They may be behind on their bills right now. And so the consequence is, the distribution companies in many of these areas are not getting the public feedback that they have relied upon for so long. Well, we've got to fix that problem, but I think, we, I think the good news is that the leak detection technologies are advancing by leaps and bounds. There are over 100 companies now in North America that are selling these technologies uh, two various segments of the oil and gas industry, and I think their work is only getting better. In the near future, we'll be seeing more satellite detection, which is not particularly good for uh, anything other than sort of spotting major pr problem areas, uh, which could be huge industrial complexes, or they could be entire basins, and I think that will bring a lot more attention, particularly on the international side, to places that have ignored this problem uh, up to now. And the last thing I would, I, I'd want to say, uh, Rick, and then I'll turn it back to you, is that uh, here's where I agree with Octavio a little bit. I'm delighted to hear him say, at, at one level, that the methane issue is a red herring. I think it may be a red herring for those companies that have chosen to go about this business correctly and responsibly. It's not a red herring for those companies who don't even know where their gathering lines are. It's, it's not a red herring in those places where distribution companies are, on the one hand, trying to respond to the science, but on the other hand, are, have got one eye on their uh, state utility commissions that are always going to say, well, I'm not sure you need more money to do that kind of thing. You've always gotten by with people picking up the telephone. So we've got to address that entire range of problems. But the good news is that the technologies exist, as we've heard from Octavio, to uh, address these problems in virtually every segment of the natural gas supply chain. And I think that's very good news. And I welcome calls from anyone and everyone in the industry and in public policy who 
are willing to stand up and say, we may not know how much longer we're going to be living with natural gas, maybe a short term and maybe a long term, but there are things we can and should be doing right now to lower the impacts on our society and our environment. Thanks for that, LG. Um, I look at the clock, and unfortunately, the challenge of being at the end of a very rich uh, discussion such as we've had today is that time does draw to a close. Uh, I know we had talked about having time for Q&As. I would ask anyone who does have specific questions. Uh, you can certainly see the panelists or the uh, speakers here after uh, we conclude remarks. Um, also, happy to take any of those questions on board uh, here at EFI. I'd like to give a shout out and special thank you to all of our guests, uh, the Senator, uh, the Congressman, uh, Secretary Moniz, Melanie, David, Jane, Octavio, LG, and Ed for uh, what I think was a really wholesome discussion. If I had to recap it, I'd say uh, a couple key themes came out. Pragmatism, you heard that in the remarks today. Um, we heard regional, we heard sequencing um, among those themes coming out. But most importantly, uh, there is a discussion that is ongoing today and bringing together these various perspectives will in fact help create the solution in the end run. So I thank you all for your time today and uh, appreciate you being a part of this important event. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.